Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good night. Whatever time you're coming at us, this is Black Comic Lords. We are here. It's your host, the boy Rich. Got my man Paul, got Derek in the building, and we have a special guest with us on today. This uh, extinguished gentleman is Mr. Rodney Barnes. He's an American screenwriter and producer. He has written and produced The Boondocks, My Wife and Kids, Everybody Hates Chris, uh, those Who Can't, Marvel's Runaways, American Gods, Wu-Tang, American Saga, and currently is the executive producer writer on HBO's untitled Los Angeles Lakers drama, which is not true. It's called Winning Time. Winning Time, yeah. Winning Rise time. of okay. the Lakers okay. Dynasty. So, yes. Yes. It's a lot yes. of work. So, yeah. yeah. You got a lot on your resume, sir. Yeah. And also, uh, he is a uh, very esteemed comic book writer in our eyes. And we are so grateful that he has allowed us to uh, spend a little time with him again. This is his second time back with us. And so with no further ado, I want to present to some and introduce to others, Mr. Rodney Barnes. How you doing, sir? Doing well. Doing well. How are you? I like the Africa Good. in Good. the background. I feel like Thank you know, you, kindred spirits. Yes, sir. Well, you know, I I, I, I don't know if you need CDs, but I got all your, your killer dust. I saw photos. that too. I saw yeah, that. Paul yeah, got yeah. one night uh, Nita Hall's in the background. I don't see nothing uh -huh. else. I see that Derek just got a wall. So oh yeah, I have a wall, but I, I did bring this with me. There you go. Yeah, see, yeah, that's right. not right. Derek just I was going. I saw two questions. So she Derek didn't, always yeah. got to be flexible. She wasn't going to support. So yeah. Yes, indeed. Well, you know, Mr. Barnes, I, I want to go ahead and get started. Um, but I wanted to ask you before we really get into the meat of the comics and stuff. You have been in the industry a uh, quite a long time, uh, and I would even say relatively new as far as comic books. Do you feel that you have gotten your just due in regards to comic books as a writer? Um, well, I'm talking to y'all. So, you know, I don't know how many people y'all talk to. So, you know, somebody's giving me some due. I mean, I don't really do it for due. I do it to do. You know, I do it because right. I've always loved comic books my entire life. Um, mm -hmm. Like much like television and film, the motivation is the same. Like even as a kid, I never liked the way we were positioned within a narrative of things that I liked. Whether it was horror films, um, action films, whatever it was, I never liked where we were. So, you know, subconsciously, I think um, I always wanted the opportunity. I hope one day to have the opportunity to tell stories in a different way. And I felt like there was a tone that I had that was different than a lot of writers um, who attempted to do those things. And I try to focus more on the cultural aspects and humanity more so than just the idea of blackness which is different for everybody because we're not a monolithic group. You can talk to four different black people who have four different experiences. And the only thing that we share is we all have melanin and whatever unique relationship we have to this country. So when it came to comic books, it was the same thing. You know, it was, um, I grew up, it's almost like you make the best, how I imagine working in the black exploitation era of film was with comic books. Um, I think a lot of those films the actors had to make the best out of what they had to work with. And they were so great that somehow they made up for the shortcomings of the script or sometimes the directors. And I think in comics, when I was a kid, um, oftentimes when we were the sidekick or, you know, there were um, comparisons to black exploitation or, you know, and how the character Luke Cage or um, whoever, um, it was never really about them first. It was about what they looked like and the perceptions of that to me as a child. And so, again, subconsciously, I was like, OK, if I um, ever get the opportunity to do this, I'm going to do it in my way. And I got into it. It was shaky at first. I didn't know what I was doing. And then um, as I gained confidence and sort of have a rebellious spirit anyway, um, 
I started to tell more and more and more stories and started to just kind of go for what I wanted to always see. So that's kind of where I am at this point. So whether or not people gravitate to it, um, I've been writing comics since 2017, so I guess it's almost five years. Um, I've had the opportunity. I still work with Marvel. Uh, I got four books coming from with Image. I've got my own company with seven books already lined up to come out. Um, you know, Lion Forge with Quinn Credible. So I don't know a lot of writers who in such a short amount of time have been able to have this much work. So it's hard for me to complain about anything because I'm getting to do the thing I always wanted to do. And that kind of that kind of brings up a point that I want to point out to the audience because um, one of our members recently interviewed uh, a brother by the name of Duran Flood, and he pointed out that you're such a hardworking man, you know. But here's here's the question that I've always had for you: um, It seems impossible that you're able to do the amount of things that you do without being a member of the undead. Ah, yourself. I mean, I do write about you it. must not sleep. Um, There's only so many hours in a day. I would question that, except for the fact that I see sun sunlight behind true. you. That's true. So that's that true. blows my theory out of but the But the water. blinds are closed. So but the blinds you know, are it's not some vampires sunlight. who have evolved to a place where if they're not in direct sunlight, um, it doesn't hit them the same. So that's that's not a denial, Mr. Barnes. I'm just pointing that, that out. It is not, not a denial. denial. What it is, I'll tell you what it is. Um, all of this... I come to later in life, you know, beyond like I'm not a guy in his 20s who got an opportunity and, you know, built to this place. Uh, I'm a guy in middle age that's getting an opportunity to do this. So I feel like a lot of these stories I've been carrying around in my head for years. And as a television writer, in, in as sitcoms, I started out in sitcoms. My wife and kids, everybody hates Chris and the Boondocks. And in sitcoms, minus animation, you're going to make a show every week, good, bad, or someplace in between. You have to write quickly and make sure you have a show. So I write quickly when it comes. Comic books are even more of an extension of that because it's just me in a room. I really don't have anyone I'm beholden to. I don't have any actors. I don't I have an editor who goes over it, and, you know, basically make sure I'm on top of things and that it doesn't completely suck. Um, but, you know, if you give me a day or two or whatever, I'm, I'm capable of coming up with some decent stuff. And I'm, I'm in a place right now with the TV shows that I'm developing and the things that I'm doing in COVID. I'm home a lot, you know, so I can sit here and talk to you guys from my office in my house, um, whereas most of the time I would be on set or I would be at the studio downtown or in Santa Monica. So COVID, I won't say it has helped because I hate what it's done to the economy and to people's lives and the people who have been hurt. But for those of us who have sedentary uh, occupations, being able to be in a room really affords one to be prolific. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, we're going to be, we're going to get into Philadelphia, the whole Philadelphia universe in a minute. But I want to ask you about the Star Wars. Uh, Bounty Hunter story crossover the old you know that you did the one shot the IG eighty eight yeah wherever I just set it down it was somewhere I just um, had it in my hand very hey. very yeah very very good issue very funny and um, I just want to commend you for that because uh, the 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 Star Wars uh, Bounty Hunters uh, that that's a big deal mm -hmm. and um, that book really stands out among all that they have put out. So I, I just wanted to just ask you about that. Um, how, how much, I guess, did you have to really get into? Because it, it literally, the story itself, is it doesn't really need the Star Wars universe for you to tell it. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm just curious, how much information did you really have to do that one shot? I had a good amount. Um, it was a team of us. Each of us had a one shot. And um, Charles, I don't know if it's Soul, Soule, I don't know exactly how I always pronounce it, Soul. Okay, cool. That, what you just said. Um, he ran, because I just said Charles, I never had to say his last name. He sort of ran a Zoom along with our editors and all of us. 
and we would compare scripts as to who was doing what the the issue before and um you know i had that i had um I was privy to his scripts, Charles' scripts before, um, and all the other writers who were doing the one shots. So I knew the direction that they were all going in. And I wanted, since I was the last one and sort of was closing out the one shots and to a lesser degree, the event of War of the Bounty Hunters, I wanted it to be kind of contemplative and somber. You know, I wanted yeah. it to feel like um, it was the end of a story, but not the end of the story. Um, right. So I wanted it to be more thoughtful. And yeah. in my Lando series that I wrote, uh, it was about the war of, you know, droids were rising up. And so I had a little bit of stuff that I had left over from that story about droids in general and how droids are sort of, um, there's not a whole lot that's been done on droids beyond them being cute or sort of sidekicks to uh, living characters in the Star Wars universe. Um, yeah. So I wanted to kind of tell a story that had meaning, was meaningful. Those are the types of story I, stories I always loved as a kid. I loved Jim Starlin when I was growing up, those Warlock books that he wrote and um, yeah. Infinity Gauntlet and Captain Marvel and all of those because they talked about life and death and all of that and meaning. And so I try to infuse a little bit of those themes in my stuff. Do you have any gotcha. more Star Wars um, projects coming up? Yeah, I'm doing a Mandalorian book. Uh, it's a straight <sighs> adaptation of the Mandalorian show. So it's not a whole lot of um, what I do, what you find in Philadelphia, and what you find in some of the other um, more thoughtful things that I do. How, how um, do you do that? How, how do you just <laughs> matter of factly say, yeah, doing this adaptation of some little series called The Mandalorian? <laughs> because it's literally. The one series that has completely revitalized the Star Wars franchise, and they gave that to you. Yes, um, that's that's and, tremendous. And thank and thank you, my editors at Marvel and Lucasfilm, who really are cool people. I mean, I really do enjoy working with them. I'm not just saying it because I'm talking to y'all. Um, because I've been doing, I've been in the entertainment business for about thirty years total. Ten years in production, twenty years as a writer. And I try not to let my highs get too high and my lows get too low. When I got into comics, and there's this thing called Twitter. It's a social media site. So I don't know if y'all have heard about it at all. <laughs> and there are times when, when people hate you or have negative things to say about you. They can just tell you because they don't know you. It ain't like you can come around the corner and fight somebody. Um, they're yeah. safe to say whatever. And I learned early on that if I celebrate myself or I celebrate the work too high, you never know how it's going to be received. You never know, you know, if I start patting myself on the back and saying all of that, I'm grateful. Don't get me wrong. I'm incredibly grateful. And I'm aware of, you know, if, if you told me as a kid, I would be able to do some of the stuff that I'm doing. I told you you were lying. So mm -hmm. I am grateful for it. But I try to stay even with everything because I've had heartbreaking things that um, I really wanted and didn't get. And I've had successes, you know, that you guys, you know, mentioned earlier on. So I just try to stay right in here with it and um, always hope for the best. But let me ask you about that. So is this going to be, to your knowledge, the first adaptation of the Mandalorian series in a comic book? I think so. I don't know. That's, I think I know that, that's huge. I know they're doing a bunch of things with the Mandalorian um, and other iterations, other things, uh, just other stuff. I think, I think, I think for the actual show itself, this I, is the um, primary adaptation that I'm aware of. And now, um, so, yeah. Because this is the Black Comic Lords, there's a point I want to make out to anyone who's watching this. Kathleen Kennedy, the president of Star Wars, Lucasfilms, et cetera. Uh, did a did a, a exclamation or a proclamation a couple years ago in which she said that the Star Wars company was going to um, enter this new era where the expanded universe of comic books, novels, video games, etc., were going to be incorporated into Star Wars canon. So as a result, this High Republic 
thing that's going on right now with Star Wars High Republic books, that's all canon. Everything that you see in the comic books would potentially be in the television series. As we saw on the new show Boba Fett, where they introduced this black car stand uh, Wookiee, that started in the comic books. So in essence, Mr. Barnes, anything you create in this Mandalorian comic book may end up on the screen. It's it's highly probable because that's 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 their chief property right now. That's huge. Yeah, I mean, and yes, this is true. But I think that if you were to talk to any of the folks at Marvel, you know, Ed Brubaker with the Winter Soldier and all of that, and, you know, guys who laid the foundation for a lot of the movies and TV shows that you see right now, if I did it with that in mind, I would be focused over there on that. If yeah. I do it just to do it, and then it ends up there, it's a, it's a nice surprise. Yeah. And then I don't want to build it. There's enough disappointment. You know, you know me for about 20 things where people said yes and gave me an opportunity. There are millions of things, may I say thousands of things, where I've heard the word no. And mm -hmm. to a young writer, um, a young producer, that can be heartbreaking. And... I just learned, you know, really early on to appreciate, um, yeah, I'm in this position. I'm writing this thing. If something pops and it becomes a bigger thing, that's fantastic. You know, but I think I heard Tom Hanks say this in the thing a couple of weeks ago, uh, this too shall pass. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's the good stuff that's going to happen. There's the problematic things that are going to happen. And I just try to judge both of them in the same manner um, creatively. I have a question um, for you. Go ahead, go ahead, um, go ahead Derek. So you, you've talked about the feedback that you've gotten, obviously your successes, but also the failures. Mm -hmm. I work in, in the technology space. Challenges, and, not failures, challenges. It, exactly, that's it. But in the technology space, uh, the key is not about being right the first time. Mm -hmm. It's about continuing to do over and over. Every time you have a challenge or a, quote, failure, fail fast, learn from it, and then do it again, do it again. So then I hear you talking about how part of your part of your writing start, um, at, at least for uh, media, was on the was on the, uh, the the sitcoms where you had to write a lot of episodes. It sounded like you really got to to get your your feedback pretty quickly and iterate as a result of that. I mean, it, would you say that that helped you to get better experience there and uh, to, to build your chops? Not just my chops uh, technically as a writer, but also my chops emotionally as a human being. Um, I don't come from the pedigree of the entertainment business or Hollywood. I'm just a regular dude from a small town in Maryland. And my, I brought my insecurities and my fears and all of that stuff to Hollywood with me. So I had to work through all of that stuff. I never wanted to be, you know, my dream wasn't to be a sitcom writer. My, my, I just wanted to be a writer. So when the opportunity came, I jumped at it because I just wanted to write. So the blessing in it is that not only did I get to write, but I had a lot of great people around me who helped me mold and shape my, um, not only my confidence, they helped me mature within the business, to help me mature as a person, that held me in check when I was going left, um, all of that. So yes to your primary answer of did it help me um, develop the infrastructure of discipline, which helps crank out all of this stuff. But it also helped me do it in such a way that um, I learned to write from my heart. In the beginning, I was writing from my head. So for those, anyone who's been reading my books for a while or uh, appreciating the things I do, there's a difference in what I've been doing for the past seven years than what I was doing for the first 13. Um, I just wanted to keep a job. You know, you have imposter syndrome and all of those things. And it was always a fear that at any moment this could all be taken away and I would be back being a security guard or whatever job I could get at the moment. So once that sort of, you know, I was able to move that to the side and accept where I am and not be afraid of where I could be, um, things got better and sitcoms and just being able to be in that business and having uh, people pull my coat or hit me to things about myself that I might not see helped me develop the self-awareness to be able to correct things um, 
without someone having to tell me that those things needed to be corrected. Okay, my next question, uh, Mr. Barnes, is um, the as far as material, you write a lot of different material. You know, where you mm -hmm. talked about the uh, James Bond comic book, you, you you know, you did the IG eighty eight book, you doing the whole Philadelphia universe thing. So I'm just curious, what is the hardest thing for you as a writer to write, if that makes any sense? There is no. You know, I, all, I look at it all as story. So it's never mm -hmm. hard to write a different type of story. I have a functional sense of humor. So I'm able to write things that are, you know, relatively funny or intended to be comedic. My true passion, for lack of a better word, is horror, mystery, supernatural. Um, I like talking about things that have real stakes to them and life and death have real stakes to them. And um, I look at life and, and I see, you know, one day it's going to end. And I like, and I think sometimes American culture, the way it's life is presented to us, it's almost mm -hmm. like we're going to live forever. Like, you know, we really don't deal with subject matter that's sort of kind of heavy, for lack of a better word. And horror opens the door to be able to do that. And so right. horror is my favorite. Comedy, I wouldn't say is my least favorite because I like writing comedy. But I've written so much of it that horror, supernatural, whatever, that's the stuff that I really get sort of, I can wake up at five in the morning and write until midnight uh, if I'm digging it. Gotcha. Oh, let me just ask, uh, as far as the horror stuff goes, so what was your favorite horror movie growing up? I loved um, dating myself and majoring myself. Nobody under the age of um, 30 is going to uh, remember any of this. Um, Cold Shack the Night Stalker was yeah. uh, my favorite television um, experience as a kid. I was a kid kid. Like I was like six years old. Right. And I didn't have, um, you know, my mother was working in a single parent household, so I didn't have a lot of supervision. So I saw a lot of things I shouldn't have seen. But, um, and I'm actually writing a uh, Cold Shack uh, for their 50th anniversary of Cold Shack. I'm writing a story for their, um, okay. their companion anthology thing. Um, Cold Shack was first ish but we had creature feature stuff that used to come on at 11 o'clock on saturday nights and i would stay up and watch the universal monster movies um and you know dracula frankenstein that kind of stuff and i just dug it it's just it it um the thrill from it um all of that salem's lot the tv miniseries that was another one that kind of got me and then somewhere around 10 11 years old i was like six feet tall so I could walk in a movie theater and nobody carded me and I don't think they really cared. Uh, it was a different day. And I saw a lot of horror films. It's like I watched a lot of horror films, but The Exorcist, Amityville Horror, um, you know, Alien, if you want to consider that to be a horror film in space, a sci-fi horror film. But Dawn of the Dead, I remember hitchhiking uh, to Landover Mall to see Dawn of the Dead at midnight with a buddy of mine. That's back when you wow. could hitchhike. Uh, and Ken Foray. Um, so it was so many, um, so many horror movies. I, I got to the point as a kid that I actually followed more creators. George Romero, Wes Craven, David Cronenberg, um, John Carpenter. I knew who all of these people were. And back then, a movie only stayed in the theaters for maybe a week, you know, or a few days. So I would rush to see those movies. And if they had a double feature, I could stay there all day. Okay. You, know, you know, there's, there's yeah. this huge proliferation now that we have in the horror genre for the black community. You've got uh, Jordan Peele mm -hmm. with what he's, I mean, Jordan Peele's like the, the modern day Hitchcock, right? Yep. Um, you've got Misha Green with what she did with Lovecraft Country. We've got you. Um, there seems to, to, to be this out of, I don't know, I want to say out of nowhere, but certainly a greater amount or great no, greater notoriety for horror in the Black community. Mm -hmm. um, what do you attribute that to, if anything? I think, yeah, it's funny. I said this to someone the other day about, uh, they asked me a similar question. And I'm like, I think we're in a period now where when I was growing up and up until maybe 15 years ago, most of the people that wrote for our culture 
weren't us. Mm. You know, they were interpreting what they thought it was. So it was right. one sort of one dimensional. Um, and then you started to get the Shonda Rhimes's and the Kenya Barris's and a lot of people who were able to infuse an honest aspect of who we are. You know, Ryan Coogler with um, the great Kraft Fruitvale Station and then Creed and then Black Panther. And you started to get this unique, fresh sort of take that just came from people who were connected to the culture telling the story. Mm -hmm. And I think when those things become successful, because Hollywood is not in the business of uplifting the race. That's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to make money. And when you see these things being done well and crafted well, and people coming out to see it, and not just people who look like us, and there's a monetary thing there. And then you have this, um, this movement in society for diversity and corporations trying to, um, you know, for lack of a better word, integrate different types of people within their power structures. You're going to get it. And then you have, again, going back to Twitter in a positive sense, when they're not talking bad about me, um, able to tell you almost in real time how they feel about a thing. You know, people, mm -hmm. corporations pay attention to that. And so when you have... Um, uh, when you have this type of material being appreciated and doing well, it only begets rising tide raises all boats. So um, I remember I had a pilot with Jordan Peele at Comedy Central, and this is one of the last comedy things he was working on. And he was pitching me just in conversation. We were talking about horror and I was talking about Alan Moore and Swamp Thing, I think, and how much I loved Alan Moore during that period. And he was pitching me Get Up. And I was like, I was nodding my head. Um, I had no idea what he was talking about. I was like, this sounds like the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and then cut to like a year and a half later, boom, you yeah. know, Get Out does what it does. And, um, you know, again, his success makes it when I walk into a studio and I'm trying to sell a thing because he's had success over there. They go, well, maybe, you know, this thing might work. Whereas I remember... Um, I had a story of the first iteration of Philadelphia. I wrote maybe now almost 15 years ago hmm. and as a movie and the Weinsteins were going to buy it. And I remember talking to Harvey Weinstein on the uh, phone and he said, uh, man, I really like this script and I think it could you know, be a thing, but could you get more white people in? Hmm. <laughs> and at the time it was set in Compton. It wasn't called Philadelphia. And I remember staying up all night thinking, because I really wanted to get this done. I didn't really have a whole lot of credits. I think it was just wife and kids at the time. And I'm like, how can I get, maybe I could put a stick of cop in there, or there's a nurse or somebody I can get in there, because <laughs> it literally was all black. Yeah, and, right. you know, you just, it didn't, you know, he was, thank you, great script, good luck with your career, and that type of thing. And um, I don't think, oh, this was the parting thing that he said to me. Well, you know, I love the script and you seem like a really smart guy, but if Vampire in Brooklyn didn't work, how is this going to work? Mm -hmm. And so you became a prisoner of whatever the thing was, you know, that, um, that he was referencing as an aspect of our culture. And so now on the flip side, when you have all of these people, like you said, the Misha Greens and the Jordan Peels and, you know, a bunch of folks, uh, Tanana Reeve Du and Stephen Barnes and, you know, Tony Todd and just different people who are doing things that are really, really, really good stuff. Um, again, it makes it easier for me to walk in a room and pitch a thing that before sounded like, uh, why am I even talking? You know, they, it's a courtesy meeting because they're going to say no. Now they may listen a little bit more. I wanted to ask as far as uh, comic book writing or whatever. Um, you know, you write on Philadelphia and Nita Haas is on Image. So mm -hmm. I was curious, would you consider writing a, a Spawn story or a crossover? Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially with Jason's, his relationship to Spawn. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, um, definitely. I, I In the beginning, I had a lot of Spawn stories when Spawn first came out um, for mm -hmm. a lot of different reasons that I won't say. But uh, I, uh, I have a bunch of Spawn stories. I would love to get a hold of Spawn for, you know, a couple of issues and do my take and, you know, see what happens. We'll, 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 we'll add Todd McFarlane and Image Comics and make that happen. 
That would be fantastic. <laughs> Big fan. Love his uh, Batman stuff early on, like before Spider-Man. I know that's what he's yeah. famous for, but the Batman stuff, um, I really dug back in the day. Yeah. Um, now, you've written Falcon um, mm -hmm. for superheroes, Queen Credible, of course, for Lion Forge. Uh, Lando, I consider Lando a superhero. Um, what, and I know that, you know, you, you, we, last time we talked, you talked about, you know, writing uh, Swamp Thing. But if what, do you have a black superhero book that you would like to get your hands on as well? Um, I have one that I want to do under my company's banner that probably be, would be closely associated with Miracle Man. Um, you know, there are a lot of folks yeah. who do superheroes. Uh, you know, Milestone does a great job with them. And, you know, the Miles Moraleses and a lot of different heroes that already exist and are fantastic. Um, I always want to, and going back to that thing about philosophy and life and all of that, um, Miracle Man was one of my favorite comic books growing up and excited to see what Gaiman and Buckingham do and this next thing. I don't know how I feel about Marvel kind of folding Miracle Man into their uh, their universe. You know, maybe it'll be great. But I always saw that story as an outlier, actually, against comic books in a way. Um, so, you know, the character that I have in mind, uh, I would love to do in a different type of way. But, yeah, I got to take a crack at it before this ride ends. And, and speaking about okay. superheroes... Um, you would you would uh, uh, put a comment on one of our or one of Rich's lives mm -hmm. that you had you're going to be working on um, a superhero who I share a birthday with. Uh oh, Luke Cage. Luke how Cage. Did, how can you share a birthday with somebody that ain't real? <laughs> his first. I want to understand his publication date of uh, Hero for Hire number one was in June of two thousand of June of nineteen seventy two. And okay. that's when I that's when I was born. So he and I both turned fifty this uh, year. So I was wondering when that book was coming out. If it was going to be coinciding with that with that June. Period. Now I'm going to call Marvel and say, you know what? Can y'all hold off? And uh, if you like this story, can you wait till June? Technically, uh, Paul's you know, birthday. Paul's fiftieth birthday. I want this to look, be special. For Paul. I'm just saying, if, so, if you're going to release a Luke Cage book, you yeah. might as well release it on his fiftieth birthday. Doing a, a I agree. I agree. I agree. I did not know that until today. Um, there you go. And uh, I won't be mad if you decide to name some character Paul. Just throwing it out there. Oh, no, 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 no. In fact, I had a Paul in mind, and now I'm, my motiv I'm motivated even more so to have a Paul. Um, and if he I'll happens to look like me, I'll be happy to forward a picture to uh, whoever the artist is. Wow. Yes. We'll That'd make sure the coloring. I don't know who the colorist is, but we make sure to get the tone right. And everything, you know, it's, it's chocolate uh, brown number five. Just there it is, there yeah. it is, and uh, it is, uh, and wow. then we'll get the background right too, and make sure that the go. posters and everything go. right. Uh, he's a mess, he's like Professor X, he works from his uh office. Um, to, to clarify that comment, um, they asked me to do this Luke Cage book, they had some elements that they want in the book. Mm. I put my pitch together about four days ago and sent it in. Haven't heard anything. Um, I'm paranoid and neurotic because I'm a writer and I live in my head with invisible people who just talk to me. Um, so I don't know. It hasn't been greenlit yet. I'm pretty confident, though, based upon how they typically work with me. The way it usually works is a couple of days from now, they're like, where's the first script? <laughs> um, that's usually how it works. Um, I have that. I'm doing a book for another book for Dynamite right now, where the editor is doing that to me now. Um, literally, as we talk, where's the book? Um, it's a it's it's a fun book. It's a um, it's a book that I think sort of takes the things that I do well, and that's sort of what I've learned from Falcon Two today to sort of stay in the arena of things that I think I do well. Um, satire and all of that. People hear these characters in the voices that they've come to know. So you're not going to change too much. You know, Falcon and Captain America are for the most part soldiers. 
So if you do what I did, you try to take them to hell and do all of this other soul searching stuff with them. People go, I don't, that, that's not where they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be battling, you know, other other people like them, uh, Nazis. They're supposed to fight the Nazis, um, which is a good thing to do. But for me, I like to um, I like the to take a character that you think you know and put them in a setting that um, you don't know and the unfamiliar. So if this thing is greenlit, which hopefully I'll know within the next few days or hopefully hours, um, it'll be different than anything that I think uh, Mr. Cage has done up to this point. Sweet, sweet. Way to go. Oh, so now we 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 put it off as long as we can. So now oh. let's get into the heart of what we're going to talk about. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit of Killer Death. Yes, sir. Um, which is, you know, anybody knows me, know that that's my favorite comic book right now. And it has been Thank since it's yeah. Appreciate it. Um, you know, the last issue that came out, issue 19. Mm -hmm. 18, we, 18. We get the answer. No. Yes. Well, 18, I'm sorry, 18. That's right. so unless you've been, been, unless you've been in my computer and you yeah. saw 19. <laughs> you know. ah, ah. We get the introduction of the werewolves into mm -hmm. the Philadelphia story, finally, and uh, we we we've been waiting, and I'm I'm not sure when 19 is dropping, but we've been waiting. And um, you you kind of alluded to or, or told the story, you wove in the story of the move that happened in Philadelphia. Yes, and um, I'm I'm just curious as to you have touched on a lot of real life stuff. Do you have more in oh, store? Yeah. Oh yeah, that, because... I mean that's a part of that's a part of me. I mean, I grew up. One right. of the, from my frustrations about how um, how we teach history uh, in America, yes. it omits it, it when it comes to our culture. It sort of omits a huge, you know, swath of events and things that have really shaped. Um, present day circumstances and in certain cities and Philadelphia being one of them. Um, right. And I always want to, you know, one of the, the, one of the agendas, even though I don't typically write to an agenda, but one of the things when I'm dealing with American history, which is a lot of what Philadelphia is because I'm using historical figures is um, what is history? You know, there's one way to look at the Civil War. There's one way to look at the Civil Rights Movement. There's one way to look at Reconstruction. But if I can blend that into a narrative and say that those events affected those characters, I think it makes you curious about, you know, uh, I remember Jupiter from Philadelphia, and someone said mm -hmm. they went and it was a black kid that uh, went and looked it up and found out that there really was a Jupiter. And that made me happy because that's the point. The point of it is to say that those holes in the way that our history is told, I'd like to fill some of it, some of them in a fun way. So as long as, um, as long as there's a Philadelphia and as long as I'm dealing with history, not to stick them in, just to stick them in because I ain't got nothing else to say. The books are always about the theme. It's a character driven book. It's always about the theme of what that story is that I'm trying to tell. But if in the journey of that, I can find move, if I can find um, the Black Panthers, if I can find um, other movements, you know, um, nationalist movements, or I think I mentioned Gil Scott Heron and one of those mm -hmm. I was a big fan of uh, when I was coming up. And, um, you know, anytime I can put that stuff in, fuse that stuff in there, it to me is holds the same weight as... Um, Talking about the other stuff, the Revolutionary War and all those other things that we learned that we really don't see many much of ourselves in. You know, there might be Christmas right. addicts or a couple people here and there. But also, I want to flip it on its head. Throw some edutainment Absolutely. in there. That's great. Yeah. Well, you know, you bring up that point and, um, you know, in our national um, consciousness right now, you know, we talk about things like critical race theory being... Mm -hmm. Uh, removed and whatnot, and fortunately, and unfortunately, um, 
avenues like Philadelphia and other writers who, who want to infuse history into their art may be how our next generation learn history. Um, or at least keeping it interesting. It's like for me, when I would read a Stephen King book or, you know, fill in the writer that I was reading, Richard Matheson, when I was coming up, and they would talk about the war or they would talk about in Jaws, the USS Indianapolis going down. And there really was a USS Indianapolis that went down. I don't know if the sharks ate them all, like, you know, in the story that was told. But, mm -hmm. you know, those things were interesting to me. And I very rarely saw any event other than slavery, you know, with us, or maybe the civil rights movement, but it wasn't really told within the narrative. It wasn't a part of the narrative and how it affected the characters. It was sort of like an outlier. You just stick it in there and then you do whatever you do with it. Uh, look, there's, I'm, I'm a strong propo proponent of the concept of edutainment in, in mixing I don't know about my message, but certainly something um, solid, something of substance with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a perfect example. When I was coming up in the 80s um, and I first heard Public Enemy, mm -hmm. you know, and you hear Public Enemy drop all these names and they drop these quotes and they and you're like, well, who's that? And you start looking up that stuff. And, and I think you, you're, you're doing kind of the same thing with Philadelphia, you know, in, in the sense that. You're, you're, you're showing these these characters that are actually part of history and it, and it makes you question and like you know what let me let me look that up because that's I didn't know that about that person and I, I want to learn more um and you have the ability to do it you've been doing it. it's great and thank you and some of the critics of the book and some of the things that I've seen when people you know it's preposterous John Adams and you know Thomas Jefferson and as a, as a Nazi would say haters true but because they're not I don't think, you know, beyond their taste, you got the right to like what you like and what you don't like. I'm not saying if you don't like it, something wrong with you. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you look at it at face value and you don't see the methodology that's there of, I'm not saying, I'm not literally your idea of what um, Thomas Jefferson is. I'll almost name somebody that's coming. Um, if you look at it at face value and you just take it as that, um, yeah, I would say the same thing. But what I'm trying to do is to say this person was flawed in this way. Mm -hmm. And if this person was one of the people who constructed this nation, it just goes to show that none of us are perfect. And sometimes we hold the founding fathers like, you know, like this is, you know, these rules um, have to stand. There are no amendments. There are no things that we learn over time that we need to adjust, not because there was anything wrong with them, but because of the nature of what we understand about humanity and technology and things change. I doubt when the Second Amendment was being formulated, they, were to, they had muskets. They didn't have guns that could shoot 100 bullets in a second. You know, they didn't have the same <laughs> conditions that we have right. right now. They couldn't fly from one continent to another continent in a few hours. They didn't have that, that perspective. And so to be able to say, this is how I saw the world in the 1700s, and this is how I see the world today. It's more about taking the past, and it's the past speaking to the present and the future, more so than just getting hung up on, is Thomas Jefferson or is John Adams? So, you know, it's not just what it is at face value. Well, th th there's a quote from issue, is it 17 of Philadelphia? Mm -hmm. And it's in it's, and it. And I it's forgot in, um, that. Huh? I don't forgot that. that was, if, I, I if it didn't happen yesterday. I but go ahead. I'm sorry. So so it's an Elysium Gardens. It says, uh, yes. The the hope of changing the hearts and minds of those who perpetrated this act is a is a fool's dream. In their eyes, um, empathy for those such as us is impossible. But most significant was that any who attempt to evolve America past the idea of its founding roots will can't read my own handwriting will face death mm -hmm. that's typically how it's been and, and i said that mostly because um you know and again you have to look at who these characters are yeah. they were never enslaved they never experienced slavery you know yeah. they came straight from north africa as conquerors 
Right. You know, so they only know being at the top of the food chain and I won't, for lack of a better word, winning. There was never that extra thing in there of um, of anger or generational trauma or any of that kind of stuff. They just know what they know. They're learning it as they go through. And I wanted to juxtapose Elysium Gardens to Philadelphia in that way. In one story, I'm telling the story of slavery, the Civil War to present and what we're dealing with. And another story I'm dealing, I'm going further back to that, further back to a period of time where, um, you know, there were Moors. It was a, it was a different reality for them. Yes. So they're learning, they're saying that with coming to a conclusion from being fans of uh, appreciators of Malcolm X, appreciators of the, the Panthers, appreciator of whoever fill in the blank. But if you look at a lot of those movements, certainly of the 60s, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, a lot of the, um, the names that we come to know, they were either killed or um, castrated emotionally, you know, their lives just torn completely apart. Um, and whatever it, uh, advances or whatever accomplishments that they made. I remember being in school when I was in seventh grade, I think, where uh, it was one of those connected dots assignments in um, history. U.S. history. And the line that you had to connect to the person was crazy man. And the only answer that was left was Marcus Garvey. Wow. And so I believed in the seventh grade that Marcus Garvey was crazy because that's what I was taught. Hmm. And later when I went to, you know, study John Henry Clark and Dr. Ben and Amos Wilson and Chancellor Williams and a bunch of other guys, um, I came to find out that he accomplished a lot of things. You know, the first transatlantic uh, shipping company and all of these other things. Yeah, he dressed with the admiral suit and whatever, but that was to define him, to have him stand out as a businessman and as a character so people had something to look up to and feel better about. But I didn't have that perspective and school didn't have, give me that perspective. So if I'm able to, again, place these people in a narrative that's not forced, that um, kind of plays with that idea of who they really were versus what sometimes we are led to believe they were. To me, it's a virtue. Wow. Amazing, amazing. So, Philadelphia, the uh -oh. universe has expanded. It has. And, 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 and I got to say, Mr. Barnes, Nita Hall's Mm -hmm. What a surprise. We knew it was going to be good. Thank you. But we didn't know it was going to be that good. <laughs> yeah, man. Thank you. I you mean, the part. I, 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 you know, uh, we had a guy on earlier today. Herschel interviewed uh, a, a, a gentleman named Rico. Mm -hmm. And Rico is, is one of our uh, elder statesmen in, the, in regards to collecting. Yes. And he raved about your writing in Nita Hawks. Thank you. And the reason why I bring him up is because it's hard. Rico is one of these kind of gentlemen that's hard to impress. <laughs> but I but know he, a lot said of this, he said this, he said this to, to us in our space. He asked, and this is his request, that you teach a master's class. Because the writing in that story, and I'm, and the reason why me and Derek did the breakdown of those two is, it's pretty heavy, and so we want to thank you formally Please. for this thank book you. because Philadelphia is great, but Nita Hawes has the potential to be even greater, which is scary well, for me. Well, yeah. thank you. And, and the intention is to scare you in the first place. Um, <laughs> you know, what I wanted with Nita Haas was to be different than, um, as a writer, you never want to be sort of uh, pegged as a one-trick pony. And right. for the folks that, the, the appreciation that folks have for Philadelphia, I really appreciate it. But I never wanted it to get to a place where it was like, that's all I got, you know? And because Philadelphia doesn't have a lot of female characters with a lot of voice, you know, you got Jose and you have, you know, Brittany, but it's mostly a male centric type book. And yeah. for me, I always want to challenge myself to see, can I do a thing? 
And do I have something to say? Nita is straight down the middle horror. Yeah, I talk about religion. I talk about philosophy. I talk about um, history as it applies to mythology, more so than history as it applies to history like Philadelphia. So a Nazi coming in um, mm -hmm. and being able to talk about demonology and um, some other aspects of the occult and all of those things, um, certainly in a setting like Baltimore, I hadn't seen a lot of people do it. And I read a book when I was a kid uh, called Legion by William Peter Blady. Uh, unofficially, it was a sequel to The Exorcist. And uh, I think technically it was The Exorcist Three. the um, George C. Scott movie was sort of loosely based on it. I was a PA on that movie for a couple of days. And um, I always, logically, I always thought that um, if a demon could possess a human being, why wouldn't that demon want that human being to kill a person? Like, mm -hmm. What are you holding back for? If you're a demon and you hate human beings, you know, why are you just trying to scare them and jump off the bed and, you know, go through all of this when technically the same things we have as human beings, you know, we can get guns, we can get knives, we can get whatever. Why couldn't we kill, you know, if, uh, if we were possessed by a demon? So there was that aspect. Um, I always wanted to do a story with a, um, you have these rhyming demons, like in the DC universe, um, you know, they have a demon who Et rhymes. Etrigan. Yeah, yeah, Etrigan. And so <laughs> I wanted, I was like, okay, I don't want to do that. But what if I had one that could sing? And a, a, a brother that had a, um, and why would he be, what would be the attraction? And I have a lot of friends in the music business, and they always tell me how how shitty and corrupt the music business is. And so mm -hmm. I grew up where it's set in Annapolis, Maryland. We did have a black uh, beach called Cars Beach. That's a real place. My mother used to take me there as a little kid. I didn't know it's because she was dating a drummer in one of the uh, groups. <laughs> but James Brown would come. The Motown acts would come. It was kind of like the last hold off to um, the Chitlin Circuit. And I remember when it closed, it almost felt like um, I enjoyed it. You know, the black people were so free. It was just, it, it wasn't just the music and the fun. It was just the feeling that I had. So when it was gone, it, was, it almost felt like the end of an era. And I wanted to tell the story of that place and that feeling. And Howling Henry was sort of a, um, an extension of that because he was a local hero. He was a local music star who had ambitions of becoming more. And for a minute he was, but like many, you know, he found the wrong people found him at the wrong time and he fell through the cracks. But, um, you know, like I said, I just wanted to tell, whereas you could look at Philadelphia in a satirical way or sometimes as being really, really heavy with history and all of that, I want to tell a different tone of a story. So if you look at Philadelphia, Nita, uh, Johnny Gatlin, um, uh, Elysium Gardens, uh, the soon to come 20 degrees past rigor. Um, all of these stories sort of have their own theme in their own world. Almost like if you go to Baltimore, Baltimore has their own way of being a city. They got their own culture. You go to Philly, same thing. You go up to LA, same thing. But we're all still black people. You know, we're all still having mm -hmm. an experience that's connected, but it's specific to that region of the country or that part of that city in that state. So a lot of the stories that I write, you know, I want them to be unique to the place that they're set in. I think Derek had a question for you about Howling Henry, because he, he, he posted something to us uh, about his discovery about Howling Henry. Uh oh. Like Howling Wolf. Was that the thing? Well, that that was that was part of it. Uh, that was actually brought up in the uh, in the video, and then the second piece of it was it sounded like his story is, you know, very similar to uh, to um, I forgot his name, Robert Johnson. Um, Robert Johnson. Yeah, Robert Johnson. Yeah, and 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 uh, Jason's picture as well of mm -hmm. of, of uh, Howling Henry looked very similar to the very iconic picture of Robert Johnson. Yeah, in the script and then talking to Johnson, because uh, talking to Jason when we start one of these things and he sort of, Jason did the layouts on Nita, but um, 
Patrick Reynolds did the interior art and well B did the interior art for a few. And um, so initially it was um, not just uh, Robert Johnson, but a lot of those guys had the same story. That's why we don't know who they are now. Not just because, you know, hip hop and rap have taken over the music, but, you know, you still know who BB King is. Um, you still know who Howlin' Wolf is. There are a lot of those guys that were able to crack through. And I think it's almost like the Negro Leagues in baseball. A lot of those guys were fantastic, but they got lost in the space of another thing. And um, so long-winded answer to say yes and a lot of other people as well. I, I like to give you a pitch. Uh oh, oh God! Did Luke Cage ain't enough. You got Luke Cage fighting you for your birthday. What else? Yeah, what that's that's, that's the Marvel. You got nothing to do. Jeez. It's the Marvel. That was the Marvel. Pitch. This, uh, this is the image on. pitch. All right. He, he went so to Paul. Now he went to Paul and uh and <laughs> to show yeah. up in Nita Hollis as well. No, 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 I don't need a man. Need, need a need a man. So it happens to well. be Paul. Paul will need his new man. <laughs> So that might not so be my, good because she she's not good with having people around her very long. <laughs> so I don't know if that's what you want, but go ahead. I don't need my mom to see a picture of me getting eaten by a demon. There you go. <laughs> so my favorite character by far has been a Nazi. Yes. I'm just fascinated by him for a number of reasons, and and a couple of things that you said really made me raise this question. Um, my family is Jamaican. Like my, both my parents are from Jamaica. That's my my background. And as a kid, I was given these books about, uh, in Jamaica, you call them Anansis, mm -hmm. right? Which are stories mm -hmm. in, for, for children. Yes. Um, very much folklore stories mm -hmm. that had parables in them. Yeah. And so I grew up, my exposure to Anansi was the concept that I was given these stories to read that had like, you know, some type of lesson in it, right? right? And it wasn't until much later that I learned about the God of Nazi, et cetera. And I put two and two together and realized that you have the God of stories and knowledge mm -hmm. from, from West Africa. Yoruba, yeah. Right. And, you know, despite slavery, despite them not allowing us to uh, maintain our culture, our religion, our written form through oral history, Somehow, mm -hmm. through all of that 400 years of, of, of indignities, that survived. Right. That concept of a Nazi survived in a different form yeah. in these books. So that, that fascinates the hell out of me. Um, one of the things that you said in, in, in one of your, I think it was issue seven, what was it? Issue 17 of Philadelphia. I don't remember mm -hmm. which issue it was. As just like you, it's all coming yeah, <laughs> me neither. together. Um, he said he was on Earth twice, once in 1920, the uh, other yes. one in 1968. Birth and of a you, nation. And you mentioned one of my heroes, which is um, Marcus Garvey, mm -hmm. which is around the 1920 era. And he said he was there only twice, but he didn't say how long. Right. So the pitch is, the pitch is Anansi goes to 1920, meets Marcus Garvey, and things happen. So that's that's kind of the pitch. All right. Um, I will say that a lot of, without actually saying it, that a lot of historical figures, some of which we may have mentioned today in our conversation, uh, may show up uh, within. There's a. I'll say this. You know, especially since you brothers have been so supportive of the books and me, and I appreciate it so much. Um, there's a big bad coming um, from the side of good that looks like us that comes from history, whose name you know. And he's a vampire hunter. He's an immortal now because the light has sort of given him, you always have to have balance. And when you have all this darkness running amok, you need the, the light to sort of balance that as well. And this brother has been infused with that. And one of the new big bads that are coming is going to tell one of the characters in our story that, you know, whether you agree with us or you don't agree with us, if we don't come together, this guy is going to kill all of us. Yeah. So part of your wish, it's not Marcus Garvey. So but <laughs> one of your, one of your, one of, in that realm is, uh, is coming. So, yeah. That's what's up. Black Comic Lords exclusive. 
Yeah, there you go. There you go. Least I could do. Thank you. Beyond putting beyond having Luke Cage fight you on your birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. So, um, Mr. Barnes, want to know? I, you know, it, it, me and me and uh, Derek talked about this. We talked about Nita's uh, little brother, Jason. 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 And we we know that. Jason may or may not be real. <laughs> we know it's real to her. Yes. Um, so when she clearly has gone through a lot of trauma, losing her, her, her family, her parents, and then taking care of her brother, then losing her brother. Yes. Um, but his, his, you know, trying to give her this this ghost like figure or whatever is trying to give her some optimism. Um, does he play a a a bigger role, or will he always kind of be kind of in the shadows? He will always play a role. Um, he will always play a role um, for a lot of reasons. If he is real, he'll play a tangible role. Um, as being her sidekick. If he is not real, he is a manifestation of her guilt and shame as to what has happened in her life. Um, so both of those dynamics, I think, from a character place, necessitate a character like a Jason to be a part, a component in the story. Um, so yeah. yeah. I can't think of any other way without giving stuff away. <laughs> Well, you, you, well, you mentioned her, her guilt, um, and to me, so far, based on what I know, I, I can't see that she would necessarily – obviously, she feels guilty because she's responsible for taking care of her, her younger brother, right? Mm -hmm. But I can't see that you could blame her for what happened to her brother. Do, we think we'll, do you think we'll find out more about those circumstances? We will. Okay. We will. I think – I wish – guilt and shame and uh, those depressive uh, emotions were worked logically. Uh, were that the case, mm. I would have done a lot more in life earlier in life. Um, it's uh, certainly, I think as a kid, um, we're all sort of narcissistic in the sense that we blame ourselves, like in divorce, sometimes the kids will blame themselves for the reason why the parents split up or, um, you know, sometimes you start to believe in some instances that the bad things that happen to you are your fault, like you're cursed in some way. Um, the mind has a tendency to play tricks on us that doesn't always work in a straight line. Um, the way Nita works uh, story-wise is each arc is six issues, a lot like uh, Philadelphia. So one storyline goes from book one to book six. Then there'll be another case for her on the nightmare blog for the next six and then et cetera, so on and so on and so on. But they'll always be attached in some odd way to um, her. You know, they'll be attached to uh, her development, her emotional development, uh, pro and con. You know, I don't want her to be the character that always has to be sad in order to be effective. You know, there'll be some growth. But um Life isn't a straight line. So for her, it'll be ups and downs and ups and downs and hopefully triumph somewhere along the way. Gotcha. All right. Can um, I ask you let one me last ask you. Nazi question? Sure. He's got this symbol on the back of his head. Yes, it's for a Yoruban symbol. You, I heard you ask that question. It's a Yoruban symbol. I think of hope. I don't remember right now. It's written down somewhere in my notes. But um, yeah, it's a... And it was funny because uh, the great Orlando Jones, who I just was talking to about 10 minutes ago, um, he always, even though he's old, he still does like the young people and, you know, puts stuff in his head, like gets the barber to put symbols in the moon and a race car, and all kinds of stuff in his head. Yeah. Um, and I thought one time when I saw him that I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if there was an iteration of a Nazi that was more closely attached uh, connected to the Yoruban um, tribe and his people that he came yeah. up out of more so than just because he was black. And what's interesting is that symbol has eight little spires on it, just like mm -hmm. the eight legs of a spider. 
Mm-hmm. I saw it somewhere. I saw it in um, a book about Yoruban folklore, and I thought it was really, really cool. And I sent it to the artist to uh, to do. That's awesome. So one one theme I'm seeing really strongly right now is is anger. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of talk from the demons about anger, um, and and even when Jason, you know, he has this choice, you know, a- after he's passed, and he senses this anger and he follows the the anger, and then even the discussion between Nita and her pastor, there's a lot of discussion about anger too. So I'm I'm guessing that's going to continue to play a, a a major role as we go forward. But is, you know, is there anything more you could share with us about, you know, your perspectives on anger and how that, you know, impacts our our lives in this story? And James um, and Jimmy, too. Yes, I think that um, grief, unresolved trauma um, mm. typically manifests itself as anger. That's the simplest form of, um, especially when it gets in your subconscious. You know, that I think that there are things that a lot of folks... Again, when we talk about generational trauma and sometimes specific things that happen to folks, um, we think we can walk it off. You know, we think that, you know, am I, you know, that happened a while ago or whatever. But the hurt and the trauma is still there. And you wonder why if somebody steps on somebody's white Nikes, they shoot them or um, you know, a lot of the violence that I think happens in the culture. I think it's because. You have a lot of people who are hurting right now, whether it's, you know, and it's not all economic, although that could be a major component. Um, Sometimes people are living lives that they don't want to live. Like I'm living a life that I don't want to be in. And that's based upon decisions that are rooted in fear um, from childhood trauma and all of that. And we haven't been, um, um, you know, therapy and uh, all of that stuff really, I don't know, has caught on in such a major way for people to deal with themselves. And so I wanted Nita and her world, even though academically she's brilliant, there's still stuff that she hasn't dealt with emotionally. So academically, she's got everything that she needs, but emotionally the things that she hasn't rolled around in her head, she has had massive trauma. And so I think part of Jason's reason for coming back beyond seeing Corson and the demons and all of that is because he loves his sister, if we were to look at Jason as being real. Or, again, if we look at the psychological aspect of it, it's that stuff doesn't, pain doesn't go away unless you deal with the pain. Trauma doesn't go away unless you deal. Some people are able to just turn off their emotions, but there's still something happening. And it may come off in how you treat your kids, how you treat your significant other, how you treat yourself. And I think that, um, you know, I I want that to be an aspect of her world as well, uh, just healing. So, yeah, anger to me is the biggest um, obstacle she's got to hop over. Do you think that that is what feeds us cynicism? Um, Yes, I I think definitely that. I think, um, you know, for those of us who have children and meaning me as well, I do not like to think of the idea of losing a child. I can't, when I see someone else lose a child, it affects me in a very, um, very visceral way. And because I love my children, my children are my world. And they give me purpose sometimes that I don't even see in myself. I want them to be proud of me. And a lot of this work, all my kids are in the books that I read. Brittany has been in Quincredible. Brittany is a vampire in uh, Philadelphia. Brianna is the other girl, her sister. Um, my older kids, you know, all of them have been integrated somehow into my narrative, sometimes not as themselves, but themes that come up between us. Um, so when I see things, when I see other people going through that stuff, um, I hurt like they hurt. Because I think, you know, you project on to their pain and how that must feel I empathize with their pain. So, um, you know, I, I'm always, um, again, it's, it's a thing of my own fears. You know, a lot of times I'm writing about the stuff that I'm afraid of. And hopefully, um, if, if I'm afraid of it, I'm hoping that the human part of the reader, that mm-hmm. part scares them too. You may not have a kid 
but you do have someone that you care about. Stephen King told me one time, I was working on a movie, The Green Mile, and I asked him questions about writing. I was afraid to ask too many, but he was talking about um, people sometimes look at his antagonist as uh, that's the scary thing. He's like, that's not the part that scares you. It's that I get you to, my goal is to get you to fall in love with the protagonist and the hero. And if you see yourself in that person, I could have a kitten come and chase them and you don't want anything to happen to that person yeah. because you identify with that person from a human place. And so I take a little bit of that and to say that um, I try to bring some semblance of humanity to all of these characters. So hopefully one of them you find yourself in or the situation at large. That's right. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the demon Corson. Yes, um, of the four demons. His, his, yes. his, say again? Of the four demons four? of hell. Yeah, it's four okay. of them. Um, but okay. Corson is the one that's causing the most trouble right now. Okay. If you John well, Gatlin, curious. there are more, but yeah. Okay. So I'm just curious. Um I I really got a I was really bugging on his on the first issue of Nita Halls when he's talking. And um, you know, it goes back to a, an old narrative in, in, in the ancient text uh about you know angels and, and God in particular. Because one of the things that I saw in the in the book for myself was you know, um, I won't necessarily say blame, but the choices that we make. And it's like he was kind of like pointing at the choices God made, in a sense, where, you know, I mean, he, he hates human beings because God made a choice to elevate them over, over, the, over the, uh, the angel. Yes. So I'm just curious, will you expand the... Uh, the demonology with those four mm -hmm. demons, or will that be something strictly no, that you're doing with Sheriff Gatlin? No, the, and, and, uh, and, and Johnny Gatlin, you will see, they have more of a stake in the story in Johnny Gatlin because the story is set in hell. But okay. um, Corson is in Philadelphia, Corson is in Johnny Gatlin, Corson is in Nita, uh, Corson will probably pop up in 20 Degrees Fast Rigor. He will always be um, even when it comes at some point to Elysium Gardens, Corson is the one of the masterminds behind all of this. And it, it allows me the opportunity to talk about demonology from a lot of different entry points. Um, mm -hmm. I saw when you were saying on the video that I was commenting on, we were talking about Christianity and how sometimes people blame, you know, slavery for the introduction to uh, uh, Christianity, when Nita was saying the lowest point, you know, we receive Christianity at the lowest point of um, of our uh, presence here in America during slavery. Yeah. And yeah. that wasn't me saying that per se. That was her saying that in the, right, sense right, right. that in the sense that she's cynical when it comes to religion, because faith is based on some people have the ability to, to face trauma and their faith can get them through. Some people say, if there is a God, why is all this bad stuff happening? Right. And she's more in that category. So anything mm -hmm. that I can find, if I'm her, to sort of sway me to be a pessimist or a cynic, more so than someone who's an optimist and, and embraces faith, I'm going to look for that. And in that moment when she was talking to that pastor, that's what she was, you know, he's trying to talk to her about faith. She's talking about history. And so they're different conversations and different arguments, but that was why I put that. I wanted to answer it that day, but I think I was the yeah, warrior. Yeah, I mean, playing you know, the here's, here's the thing, Mr. Barnes. I, I think that that's the conversation that a lot of us are afraid to have. Yes, because exactly. Because it's a very real conversation. It's, exactly. it's, a, it's a conversation in, in the national and the and in our world, you know, on a global scale. You know I mean? It's, it's, it's like I can't close my eyes and say, okay, wish white supremacy didn't use the Bible and, and didn't use religion to enslave, you know, the whole entire civilized world, you know, that I would be lying. Yes. Um, but it's, 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 if, if nothing else, but what I got also from that was that he, you know, he, he tried to instill the realities that our choices and in our case, free will is the constant in our world. 
Yes. Even when there's full of the evil that goes on, man is free to do what he does. He's not and, he's not restrained at all. Yeah. Yeah. An aspect of that is in issue five. Um, a conversation in that speaks a little bit to what you're saying right now. I think, um, okay. you know, the bigger thing, regardless of what your faith is, to me is um, finding something greater than yourself brings humility. If you see yourself as the center of the universe, you're probably going to have problems. And uh, I think for Nita is in a, Nita is in a place where right now, I think insecurity um, creates a, its own kind of narcissism. Mm in the sense that if I'm worried about what you think of me, I'm gonna have an arm out to not really let you get to know me. And I'm really not able to get to know you because I'm really more concerned with what you think of me. And so right. it's hard to make human connections and friendships when I'm so focused on um, your thoughts coming back. If I want you to see me as cool or, smart or whatever. Uh, I'm not really listening to you talk about, you know, whatever is important to you and I'm getting to know you in a particular way. And I think, and it doesn't have to be mean spirited, you know, but I think it's just a natural byproduct of someone who is self-centered, but that self-centered, self-centeredness comes from insecurity and pain. And so I think opening up to some of the concepts that you're talking about requires Nita to make peace with some of the things that have happened in her life. Right. Okay. Now, um, we're getting ready to wrap this up, uh, Mr. Barnes. Wanted to ask you, the last book that you mentioned. 20 Degrees Past Rigor. Could you tell us about that? I can. It's set in Flint, uh, Flint, Michigan. Um, it's a zombie book. Yeah. It is zombies that are basically on the surface born out of um, the waters of Flint, the dirty, polluted waters of Flint. Wow. And when the human body dies and it gets to 20 degrees past rigor mortis, that's when they return. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> but they don't return in the way that like the walking dead zombies, these die, these zombies have a little bit more going on. They can still talk and it's not just about eating flesh. Um, they're a little bit more involved than what we've come, the Romero zombies or the Kirkman zombies or, or that they have a different thing. Um, to a degree they can think and use the relationships that they've had with you against you. Um, and so they're a little meaner. They're a little meaner. They still work as a collective. They still run in hives or pods or, you know, whatever the group of zombies would be. But um, it's a different book, but it's set in the Philadelphia world. You know, every once in a while you will mention uh, the things that are going on in Philadelphia. Man, it's dark in Philadelphia. The National Guard has cut off Philadelphia. And we know, for those of us that read Philadelphia, we know it's because it's vampires in, uh, there. And every once in a while, you'll mention in Baltimore, there's this uh, this murder that happened the other night that's kind of weird. And that's Henry and them and what's going on with Nita. And at some point, some of the characters may cross streams and um, the narrative sort of dictates it. Like Elysium Gardens, you know, it was more of... Um, all of the story in LA uh, that needed to be told was told and they want to still find out about their curse. Can it be lifted? Can they this, that, and the other? And they, they find that there's this energy and this thing that's happening in Philadelphia and we should go to that. And so, you know, that's sort of what it is. And this is called okay. 20 degrees past rigor mortis. No, 20 degrees past rigor. And past rigor. Yeah, that's it. And there's another book that's coming from, um, outside of, uh, it'll be on the Substack as well, but it'll probably, if it's ever printed, come from my company. Um, it's called The Butcher of Black Bottom. It's a serial killer. It's not supernatural. It's a serial killer in uh, Black Bottom, a town in Detroit, the black part of Detroit. And um, there's a serial killer that's killing certain people in a certain community while the race riots of the 20s are happening between the Irish and black folks. Mm. And so wow. since we don't have a um, like our own police department, we have to figure out a way to find out who is doing this while working with the police um, because the tensions are boiling over and the whole city could go to hell if we don't stop these murders. Kind of like the Atlanta child killings um, that were happening in um, 
back, I think, late 70s, early 80s. Are there any other properties that are going to be identified or come out that'll be part of your Philadelphia verse? Well, there are five right now. So, you know, to continue to expand that, I think um, it's kind of tough because I still want to build them into recognizable aspects. It's like Nita is only four books in. Um, Rigor is one book coming at, I think, the end of this month. I think the 31st is when it'll be on the Substack. Um, Elysium Gardens and Johnny Gatler are only 10 pages each, you know, when they come out. So to me, developing those stories to a place where if the public wants more, I can continue to make more. I'm not sure on a story um, at all. But um, between that, it's developing uh, Zombie Love Studios and the Zombie Love Books, um, Blackula, uh, Florence and Normandy, um, Tales from the Crypt with Snoop Dogg, um, and about five other books that will probably start. Will Blackula be part of the Philadelphia verse? No, Blackula, Blackula could. And it was funny because I actually pitched Marvel something with Blackula. Um, use your imagination and think of where a black vampire like Blackula. Who would be good to work with a black vampire like this? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't say any names. Um, you know, and I think the Blackula book, the Blackula book will be first and it'll be September of this year. And okay. Incredibly proud of what Jason has done artistically. I think Jason has topped, and really in the last um, the last volume of Philadelphia as well, his art has been even better than I think his art has been uh, coming along. He likes drawing werewolves too, so I think that's part of it. But um, the Blackula book, um, once that lands, and we'll see how that's received. We will see how far, you know, because I got to pay MGM to let me use this character. Uh -huh. So... Um, you know, how long I do this really has a lot more to do with um, mm. the consumer base and, you know, what they like and what they don't like. So <laughs> what are the chances that we may see at least one of these stories that I'll call part of the Philadelphia universe uh, to, to start out a KCU, a Philadelphia cinematic universe? Oh, uh, well, the... Philadelphia has already been optioned. There's a script. There's a big actor attached to it. I'm trying to get a director right now. Um, Philip Morris? Oh, uh, no, not Philip Morris. I love Philip, though. Uh, we're <laughs> supposed to be going to lunch. Philip, if you're watching this, I'm sorry I've been busy. Um, but I do want to go to lunch with you desperately. I'm a big fan of yours. Um, no, um, a different actor. You know his name. Um, and I think you'll be happy when you okay. hear him. Um, Working on filling out, you know, a lot of times when it comes to packaging a television show and getting a show on the air, almost like what we're doing with the Lakers right now, your cast plays a big role as to where you go and where it fits on the right. television screen. So we have one actor working on the director and working on filling out that primary cast of Jimmy uh, Sanctuary Sr., Jose, maybe Adams, um, and our director, and then there's me um, as uh, running it and creating and then doing all of that stuff. So once Philadelphia is set up, then I'll probably go after Nita, um, trying to get her going, and then 20 Degrees, <laughs> and then Johnny exactly Gatlin, exactly. and all of those. Um, is it's HBO? Not, uh, don't know. Don't know yet. Don't know yet. Uh, again, we got to put the whole package together and then present it to HBO. And they have to say, we like this package. And if they say no, then you got to go to Netflix and Showtime and all these other places. But I would love, 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 love for one network to be under different shows, to be under the banner of one network, because yeah. then it would be easier to cross streams. If like the CW, you know how they did like uh, Arrow and then Arrow would be on Flash and then you know, all of that. I would love to be able to do that with um, a different type of show that uh, wasn't superheroes or any of that, but the world that I sort of put together. Given HBO's and, track record with Lovecraft Country and the Watchmen series, mm -hmm. that'd be just a perfect fit. That's it would be fantastic. It would be a dream come true of my relationship with them. My deal is with HBO, um, uh, HBO Max. Uh, I love the idea of that. But going back to the earlier part of our conversation, I never let my highs get too high, my lows get too low. So as great as that sounds, if I start saying, yeah, HBO, and they say, hey, we don't like none of this. And then I'm like, oh, man, 
I guess I got to go to whatever. So a BET signature. And, um, you know, there you go. Okay, so we're looking at a we're looking at a TV show to start things out. This is what I. We hope yeah. so. Yes. Oh, awesome. That would be awesome. And then uh, you you meant you know we talked about the Lakers uh, show. Um, mm-hmm. I don't I don't know how much has been released. I've seen a, a trailer for it and I've yep. seen the cast, but um, is there a little? And I I know this is a drama, but based on some of the actors there, it's going to have quite a bit of uh, of. Uh, some, some comedy too right it's a I number of things if you know that adam mckay tone of where yeah. you know there's a one scene could be incredibly um layered and deep and then you could have another scene right next to it that's comedic it's like it's not one thing there's a it's a myriad of things they're things that are layered and relatively thoughtful and introspective and then the next scene you're playing basketball um it's a lot of different things it's tough to describe quick thing would be a dramedy um, but it's a lot of different things. It's probably the best thing I've ever been a part of and um, very proud of it, very anxious to see what uh, people think about it. But a uh, really, really, really big show with a great cast. And, you know, as a writer, you always hope it's the same thing in working with Jason and a lot of the great artists who do variant covers for us and that thing. I think you get better when you work with the best talent. You know, when you get the best people around you, they push you to be better. And I think um, for me as a writer and a producer, this show has probably pushed me more than any other that I've been a part of. And, and is the aspiration that this would be maybe a multi uh, season it type will of be. A series? Yeah, we're, oh, we're writing be. season okay. two now. And um, I think three seasons is where we stand now, but there's potential because, you know, there's a storyline that goes from, magic coming in to the Kobe and Shaq years. That's what I was wondering. That's Jerry West. And Jerry West is a part of all of that. Dr. Buss is a part of all of that. Jeannie Buss is a part of all of that. Magic comes back and is a part of all of that. So Mm -hmm. there is the potential for that there. Has that been, um, you know, has anybody greenlit any of that? No. Uh, Right now we just got what you're going to see the first week of March. But, um, you know, we're always hoping for more. I can't wait to see that. Me too. That's going to be dope. Yeah. We got to right. wrap this up. But before we go, Mr. Barnes, I have one final question about Nita Hawk. Oh, and what's, what's the story? What's the story with the horse head, the horse man or whatever? It yeah, is? yeah, yeah, yeah. If you in demonology, um, if you look at different cultures and how they um, process demons, um, you see hieroglyphics or you see artwork or you see any of those types of markings. Um upside down goats and just, you know, a lot of different things to mark that this is either the antichrist or somehow connected with something that is opposite of, you know, upside down crosses, all types of things. Um, Corson and the four demons of hell, the four master demons of hell. Um, There's a lot of history sake, iconic uh, imageries of that. That's sort of what that's connected to. Um, okay. Again, one of those things like a Nazi's thing in his head where I found something that I thought worked. And from a detective place, when you have a de- detective Harden, who's a cynic, um, you know, and she starts to investigate this stuff and she starts to find that um, this isn't gang related. This isn't any of that. This is something, you know, we're talking to someone like Nita, who has um, a working knowledge of this stuff, who just doesn't believe. Because if there's a devil, there's got to be a God, too. Um, and then you have a detective Harden who doesn't believe anything. You know, it's almost like what she believes is that bad people on the street. She's an agent of good. And this is how you stop them. There's none of that other stuff in there. And what do you do when you start to see um, satanic or um, that type of stuff there? It causes you to raise an eyebrow at the very least. Hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Well, guys, you guys got any final questions? If not, we're going to wrap it up. I, I just wanted to recap for anybody who's interested in getting a complete picture of this universe that you're building out. Um, we got Philadelphia on Image, which you can uh, buy and or- pre-order in your local comic book store. You got Nita Hall's Nightmare, Night- Nightmare blog, which you can also pre-order in your local comic book shop. It's very important that you pre-order before the firm order cutoff because that's what drives, uh, that's what shows uh, uh, the, uh, the publishers that, hey, 
there's there's true interest in the book. But then you also and, got and don't, don't say you don't know when the final cutoff is because I gave it to you. Yeah, week. Paul does it every week. And then we've got <laughs> on on Substack and make sure I'm correct. We've got Johnny Gatlin on Substack. Johnny Gatlin. And Elysium 20, Gardens. Yes. Oh, yep. And twenty degrees of past rigor. Yes, that'll be dropping one week from today. Okay. All right. Just okay. want to make sure people know where to go to find these. Yes. And the website for um, the Substack? Uh, it's a uh, Rodney Barnes Substack. Uh, I, I don't know that one off the top of my head, but if you go to my Twitter and or Instagram pages, Rodney Barnes, uh, the Rodney Barnes, it's in my bio there. It's like Rodney Barnes backslash Substack.com, something like that. And um, it's pretty easy to find. Before we wrap up, go, go ahead. I, you ain't got no more pitches to, for me, do you? Oh, no. Okay. Because you're almost talking yourself out of fighting Luke Cage. No, no. Actually, I was, right, I was, to, uh... I was right on the edge. I was right there <laughs> letting you in. So I'm just saying, don't mess it up. A lot of I'm, times, I'm not going to mess it up. I'm going to try and reinforce Close it. the deal on, on a good note. Um, we This is this is our variant cop um, comic yeah, book. Yeah, Black Cop. Yeah. Black Cotton, um, we're going to send this to you as a thank you, a small thank you oh, for, for thank giving you. us some of your time. We really appreciate no, you and yeah. what you've done. Please do. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And send your books to me. Um, I'll take care of them for you. I appreciate that, brother. All right. Well, this is Rich, your boy Rich, again with Paul and Derek and with the Honorable Mr. Rodney Barnes. We want to thank you, Mr. Barnes, for your time. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. Whatever you have going on, please reach out to us. We definitely are going to support. <laughs> I am a fan of yours. And, um, you know, all that good stuff, man. So for me, this is just a blessing. So thank you. Uh, you've been so gracious. And so, you know. I appreciate you, brothers, man. We have to have a talk when Blackula is about to drop. And um, oh, hopefully by know. then you'll have some Philadelphia questions, some more of them, and some Nita questions. And who knows what questions come from there. So some winning time questions. Oh, I will ask, bro. Now, I will yes. ask. The Substack stuff. Yeah. Elysium Gardens is, my, is, is, is one of my favorite stories, whatever. Will eventually you do that in print? Um. I hope so. It's all up to everything that drives like what will I do it in print or will it ever be more than this really comes more from demand. You know, it's like if yeah. people dig it and people want it, I'll try my best to do it. Um, but it really comes from more of if the people enjoy it and, and they get something out of it. Um, I don't want a bunch of boxes in my garage. Um, <laughs> full of books, you know. I mean, if I might do a special one for you, Richard, uh, but it is, it's more of that. It's like if the people dig it, I think we got a hardcover Philadelphia edition coming out of volume one and two, um, this okay. fall, um, and you know, stuff like that. So it's slowly becoming what, uh, what you know, I would ideally like it to be, which is just something that, uh, we can continuously build off of, but it takes time. It really does. It takes time to um, find that readership and to just to find folks that don't immediately judge a book by its cover. That's what's up. Well, again, we want to thank you, Mr. Barnes. We uh, bless you for your time. Thanks. Thanks so much. You're more from, than welcome uh, anytime. Yes. From Black Comic Lords, Black Superheroes Forever, we are here. We are signing off. We want to thank everybody for joining in and, and, and those of you that will see us mark my words Philadelphia is going to be a household product we're going to help make it happen you know whether it be HBO or Netflix whatever it is you know we're going to be right there beating on somebody door till we get this done so Mr. Barnes I promise you you know that this this one thing I love about Philadelphia the Philadelphia universe is that authentically as black comic collectors or whatever we fight every day with people when it comes to original content so mm -hmm. to have a black man such as yourself giving us original content you help us you know stand on the wall when it comes to fighting for uh these products or whatever because you know i don't want to get ahead of myself man but you know at some point we got to talk toys Mm -hmm. We gotta talk merch. All of it. You know, all of that. So 
you know, let us know when that's happening because we're going to be on board for that too. We'll do. you, But again, you know, the foundation is the stories that are being told. If people aren't connected right. with the stories, all that other stuff is just stuff. It's like, at the very least, um, it's up to me, Jason, the rest of the team to continue to deliver quality stuff over time. And then, yeah, man, you know, let's see what happens. That's my only that's problem with your book, sir is I read the Philadelphia Need Out Pause books, and then if I have to read a subsequent comic book, like your writings here, like everything after that, it's just like, eh. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. that that'll that help me not procrastinate tomorrow because I didn't do nothing today. It's three <laughs> days in a row. Two, the football games of the weekend between that and today, I've done nothing. So that motivates me yeah. to do something tomorrow. That's what's up. Well, thanks again, uh, Mr. Barnes, and uh, again, Thank from Black Comic Lords, Black Severe Spell. This is Rich. This is Paul. This is Derek. We love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it until we see you again. Peace.